campaign spending hits a record why it could be the new norm. In today's cover story, an unexpected surprise from a gauge of the manufacturing sector. Plus, Americans go big as gas prices plummet and our money managers shifting into small caps. First business starts now. You're watching First Business. Financial news, analysis, and today's investment ideas. Good morning, everyone. I'm Angela Miles. It's Tuesday, November 4th. In today's first look, politics and money. As Americans head to the polls, traders consider what it will mean for the stock market if the balance of power in Washington changes or remains the same. In earnings after the bell last night, Sprint missed on earnings. The wireless company is also planning to cut 2,000 jobs. That stock fell 7%. Herbal Life had an earnings miss. That stock plunged 14%. And it was a rather tame day on Wall Street Monday after last week's rambunctious rally. The Dow hit an intraday record high Monday but closed down 25 points. The Nasdaq nudged up 8 points on strength from semiconductors and the S&P 500 closed unchanged. Gold lost another $6 and oil $2.38. Trader Dan Stesich of Athena Advisor Services joins us now on this Tuesday morning. Good morning to you. It is Election Day. How will that affect the stock market? Well, I think you're going to see a little bit of election fatigue here. Um, regardless of what the outcome is today, the market has rallied quite a bit coming into it, so there might be some disappointment either side of it, maybe a little bit of a fallback. I don't expect much. What I am looking forward to is not having to watch the endless uh, <laughs> hours of nonsense commercials that we've had to see. So that's There a good were so thing. many this year. All right, on to the jobs number coming out Friday, as well as other economic news coming into the market. Exactly. Um, you mentioned employment on Friday, but on Monday we had ISM manufacturing came out terrific. People didn't think it'd be so good. Tomorrow we have non-manufacturing. The employment numbers of the last few months have been pretty good. I think that's going to be the same this time. So keep an eye on it. The fundamentals drive this market, not the elections. The fundamentals will say where we're going. So could those numbers, Daniel, drive the stock market higher? Oh, absolutely. If we see strong fundamentals on the employment, given everything we've seen since mid-October, all these numbers have been good. You're going to see this market go higher. It's justified. Thank you, Dan. You're very welcome. Tech Coppola joins me now with stunning news about J.P. Morgan Chase. Angie, the Justice Department is investigating J.P. Morgan Chase. The bank said Monday that the DOJ is conducting a criminal investigation of the bank's foreign exchange trading activities. JPM says it is cooperating with the investigation. The bank also revealed its legal losses may be mounting. It says its litigation expenses may be closer to $5.9 billion, up from an estimate of $4.6 billion three months ago. A former Bank of America employee is charged in the gruesome murders of two women in Hong Kong. The man, a British banker named Rurik Judding, has been charged with two counts of murder after police found two women dead in the man's Hong Kong apartment. Bank of America confirmed to the Associated Press that the man worked for B of A until recently, but did not provide any other details. In our cover story, manufacturing's comeback. Production at U.S. plants increased to the highest level in 10 years. It's based on surging demand for goods here in the U.S., tempered slightly by production for the energy sector. In 16 U.S. manufacturing industries, more things were made in America in October than any time since 2004. The Institute for Supply Management's Purchasing Managers Index jumped to 59 percent. The month before, the index stood at 56.6 percent. Anything above 50 percent means manufacturing growth. The economy is doing well just in general. It's, it's rebounding. Um, the holiday season is coming up. And then you've got the manufacturers who are realizing that they've been stretched very thin with their long supply chains manufacturing overseas, and they're starting to bring a lot of that manufacturing back. The figures are compiled from a survey of executives who order raw materials for manufacturing. And there are signs that manufacturing's growth may continue. The ISM index of new orders went up to 65.8 percent, less than a point under August's new orders, which were the highest in five years. But one industry that is not reporting growth, petroleum and coal. Manufacturers that are producing goods towards oil and gas industry are holding back now because 
uh, the prices are down and the production is down. Therefore, they don't use as much as pipes, steel pipes, as they would, for example. They don't use as much machinery as probably they did. Manufacturing has been on an upswing all year, boosted by car and truck sales and other big ticket items. And in particular, demand for new aircraft. In September, Boeing said China will take delivery of more than 6,000 planes over the next 20 years, a large part of Boeing's business in which it will build 36,770 new aircraft. But in the shorter term, the export index fell two points to 51.5 percent. That's the lowest in a year. Some say the stronger U.S. dollar is partly the reason. Falling gas prices are causing an acceleration of SUV sales. GM, Toyota, Chrysler, Nissan, Volkswagen, and Honda all reported sales gains of SUVs and trucks last month. Analysts say it's because consumers are less concerned about the cost of filling up the tank. We're seeing even among cars, shoppers are moving from smaller cars into larger mid-sized cars. So again, higher transaction prices, more features, more equipment, a little bit less fuel efficiency, but with prices at the pump like they are right now, shoppers don't seem to mind that. Here's how overall sales stacked up for October. Chrysler sales rose 21.7%, driven by sales of Jeeps and Rams. GM sales edged up 0.2% compared to last year. GM made history with its average transaction price reaching a record $34,700. Ford sales dipped 1.7% as the car company prepares to launch its new aluminum-bodied F-150. The U.S. Justice Department and Environmental Protection Agency levy a record fine on two Korean automakers. Both Kia and Hyundai are accused of overstating gas mileage figures on 13 car models. It's a violation of the Clean Air Act, and the EPA is imposing a $100 million fine. This will send a, a strong message that cheating is not profitable and that any company that violates the law will be held to account. This is also um, a, a, about them changing the way they actually do their business internally in both of these companies. Because we believe that the way in which they did their testing was systemically flawed. Both companies are owned by Hyundai and deny any wrongdoing, blaming the results on unclear EPA regulations. September marks a second straight month of declines in commercial building, according to the Commerce Department. The decline in construction spending came despite a slight uptick in residential housing expenditures. That increase of 0.4 percent was offset by a drop of 0.6 percent in non-residential building. Government construction was also down by 1.3 percent. Economists predict the declines will be temporary. Fed Chair Janet Yellen goes one-on-one -on -one with President Obama. Yesterday, Yellen met with the president in the Oval Office, their first one-on-one -on -one meeting since Yellen took over as chair of the central bank. According to a White House spokesman, their discussion focused on the near-term and long-term outlook for the U.S. economy, as well as a global outlook and the Consumer Protection Act. President Obama leaves this weekend for a trip to Asia. The trip will include a meeting with G20 leaders. Apple considers another bond sale, this time in euros. A call with investors was held yesterday to discuss the topic, according to the Wall Street Journal. Apple has never before sold bonds in any currency other than dollars. Its last bond sale was in April when it sold $12 billion worth. Apple shares closed last at a record $109. Pop singer Taylor Swift is shaking off Spotify. Swift is expected to break records with her new album, 1989, but it won't play on digital music streaming site Spotify. The singer has removed all of her music from the service. Swift writes in the Wall Street Journal, It's my opinion that music should not be free. What Swift is doing is commonly known in the music world as windowing. Artists want the album to sell versus making it available free on websites. Spotify tweeted its response. We hope she'll change her mind soon. There's always a chance the Spotify Swift breakup could someday turn into a song. Virgin America is preparing for takeoff with an IPO. The airline has set terms of its public offering, hoping to raise $300 million by pricing shares between $21 and $24. This could value the airline at about $1 billion. The IPO will land on the NASDAQ sometime before the end of the year under ticker VA. Virgin is partially owned by billionaire Richard Branson, who is also the founder of the Virgin Group. That company is reeling from last week's tragic crash of its Virgin Galactic rocket ship. One pilot was killed, another was injured. Anticipation is high today ahead of Alibaba's first earnings report since its mega IPO in September. 
Now comes word that the second largest IPO of the year is on its way. National Commercial Bank, Saudi Arabia's largest lender, is expected to generate $6 billion with the sale of 500 million shares in the U.S. market. And big investors are reported to be in a hurry to get in on the IPO action. Morgan Stanley says the stock is likely to begin trading next week. Sears hopes to get a head start on holiday shopping. The retailer joins Macy's and Kohl's by opening doors at 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving and staying open through Black Friday. Kmart opens at 6 a.m. and will stay open for 42 hours straight. Costco, Barnes & Noble, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, TJ Maxx, Sam's Club, and GameStop will all be closed on Thanksgiving. Red Lobster recommits to lobster. Struggling restaurant chain now under new ownership after being sold by Darden Group is tweaking its menu. That means pork chops and tortilla soup, that'll be replaced by more lobster dishes. The menu redo is now 85% seafood, that's an uptick of 10%. The new management is abandoning the idea that the chain should try to attract diners who don't want seafood. On the economic calendar for today, it's a trade balance numbers along with factory orders. On the earnings calendar price line, CVS Health, FireEye, Motorola Solutions, Michael Kors, Burger King, Monster Worldwide, Myriad Genetics, Alibaba, as we mentioned, and Office Depot. Still to come, what to bring to the bargaining table as performance review season kicks in. Plus, Standing Tall, the first business to move into the new World Trade Center. And after the break, a look at what some are calling a money milestone for campaign spending. Voters in four states will have a chance to determine a new minimum wage for local workers. Referendums appear on the ballots in Arkansas and South Dakota, calling for a minimum wage hike to $8.50 an hour. Nebraska's calls for $9 an hour, and Alaska's $9.75. These are so-called red states where minimum wage increases tend to be resisted. Despite this, polling indicates the measures are likely to pass. It's been an historic election season with total campaign spending reaching more than $100 million in a key Senate race. Kai Sisson reports from Capitol Hill about the midterm money mania. Is all about. That's the truth about Tillis. It makes me want to not vote. It just makes me want to say, just all of you go away. She's 96% for Obama. No one in the country is immune to the constant television ads, yard sign tsunamis, volunteers canvassing neighborhoods, and phone calls pleading for your vote. But in North Carolina, the race for U.S. Senate has been more intense than any other. The campaigns of incumbent Senator Kay Hagan and challenger Tom Tillis have generated a combined $108 million in donor dollars. MapLight is a nonpartisan research organization that studies the power of money in politics. And this new milestone in campaign spending is something they say is cause for concern. The more that candidates are dependent on this money to run for office, the more they have to align with wealthy interest groups and donors, and the less individual voters have a say. The North Carolina Senate election, among others, is overwhelmingly funded by outside groups. They are responsible for three times more than what the candidates are spending a trend to what the future of elections looks like. As we go forward, our elections are going to cost more and more money. Outside groups are going to have more and more influence and impact, and politicians are going to spend more and more time raising money. Tonight on KPI Some local TV six. stations across the country have sold out of ad time, including Manchester, New Hampshire. Others are close to selling out, even at a nearly 700 percent increase in the price for airtime in many markets. Allison believes focus should be on the candidates themselves. Spend more time with, you know, candidates debate, they give speeches, you know, pay attention to what the candidates are saying, look at what they do, check out voting records. Which party will have control of the Senate is dependent on only a few candidates, so other elections are also pushing record spending, including in Colorado, where Senator Mark Udall and challenger Cory Gardner have spent $94 million, and in Iowa, Bruce Braley and Joni Ernst are on track to have spent $83 million on their campaigns, and according to recent polling, all of these races are pure toss-ups. In Washington, D.C., for First Business News, I'm Kai Sisson. The biggest fear threat to the stock market is if there are no clear winners in key Senate races. Uncertainty tends to make for a nervous marketplace. Coming up, the stock trend that one money manager is noticing as we close in on the end of the year. And after the break, how to shine in your annual performance review.
World Trade Center is open for business. The debut of the tallest building in the country comes 13 years after the Twin Towers were destroyed September 11, 2001. According to its Port Authority owner, the 104-story building is 55% leased. Condé Nast publishing employees become the first to move into the skyscraper. The final dollar figure to build the structure hovers around $4 billion. That is double the original estimate. Bill Mahler joins us now with money tips you can use at the office. You're a salaried employee. Well, lucky you. You get to go through the annual performance review. And you know, review season's coming up. The Society for Human Resource Management says 90% of companies do this, but the process is hated by employees and managers, and their value is really suspect. Tom Gimbel, he runs the staffing firm LaSalle Network, and you see this all the time. They don't engage workforces. In fact, they often demoralize people. They really do. I mean, managers and employers, they don't realize the um, anxiety that employees have leading up to performance reviews. And the reason that is, is because employ managers are not engaging the employees throughout the year. I've said for decades that employees should never be surprised at what comes up in an annual review. And Tom, they're always tied to a raise, so that adds a little extra level of Well, employees hope they're tied to a raise, Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way the economy's been the past few years, there isn't always a raise tied into it, which is even more important to have the, the conversations leading up to it. So every quarter, I, I would personally think, depending on the ratio, managers should be talking to their employees once a month about where they are, how they've handled projects, so it continues to be a process that leads up to it. It should be a ladder effect. All right, Tom, I've got my performance review coming up. What should I say, do, and act to come across as best as possible? Well, number one, as an employee, you really should be requesting information from your manager throughout the year. So having ongoing dialogue. Do it verbally as well as via email. You don't want everything to be just via email. You've got to have face-to-face -face interaction. Number two, you really have to document what you've accomplished. So there's two things. Either A, you're in a position that saved the company money, or B, you brought in revenue. So know what those accomplishments are. And three, talk about what you've done culture-wise. Either A, were there philanthropic um, aspects that the company wanted you to engage in, B, were there team building activities, or C, were there other um, projects that the company wanted you to uh, accomplish that you did that so were outside of your job sport? It's interesting. You said if the company doesn't talk to you regularly through the year, the employee should proactively see that perhaps that's done. You need to be accountable to yourself. So if manager, uh, not all managers and not all companies train managers on how to become effective leaders and communicators. As an employee, you've got to own it. You've got to go and initiate the dialogue to your manager. Tom Gimbel from LaSalle Network. Thanks so much. Always good to be with you. Still ahead, why hedge funds have been wrong about the stock market and a money manager's thoughts on how to be right. Our talk is next. President of MWS Capital joins us now for some small talk. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning, Angie. You're taking a look at small cap stocks for us. Let's start with the Russell. Is it about to run out of steam? Well, I don't know. Maybe everyone's going to now bet against it, but that was the wrong move. It's up 12%. I mean, can you imagine the rebound that we had? Everyone was just really caught flat-footed, especially the high-frequency, high-volatility hedge fund traders because, you know, betting against small caps was the big trade so far this year. Now everyone has to go the other way. So I think Santa Claus is going to deliver a small cap and Russell 2000 Santa's rally. IJR is another index that contains small cap stocks. Is this something that you would buy? I would, and it's something, it's one of the few ETFs I do own. It's the um, S&P 600 small caps. Again, didn't do so well all year, had a great 2013, of course, but again, rallied about 12% from the lows. And I think that's one of the trends we're going to have to close out the year because, you know, the big caps have done pretty well, but managers are trying to chase, catch up with performance, and some of the small caps are really the ones that they can really hold on to and come back. So not only these ETFs, but, you know, your standard standard small cap growth or value fund are all on the comeback. Matt, why do you think it is that hedge fund managers have been so wrong about the market this year? Well, I just think we're in this modern market. I mean, how could um, Texas Instruments be $40 a couple weeks ago and then 50 This happened 
countless times over the past three weeks. And I think there's just this volatility of things in the underlying economy that people haven't really grasped. And hedge fund managers, money managers rely on trends. And, you know, we just don't have these trends. Uh, companies have a bad quarter, the stock drops, and then they come all the way back, have a good quarter next. So I think the one trend that everyone's hoping for and betting on, including me, is that the small caps on the Russell 2000 were beaten down way too much. We've had a recovery in the market, and that performance is going to even up. Thank you, Matt. We've been following your trends, and so far you have been on trend. So thanks for coming on our show. You're welcome, Angie. That does it for our show for today. Coming up tomorrow, the Intel on Intel. How the chip maker plans to make a fashion statement with wearable tech gadgets. From all of us at First Business, happy election day. The polls await your vote. Thank you.